Good morning, ag leaders, farmers, all in the industry. Thank you for this invitation today to be with you and offer this invitation for the Ag Breakfast. Uh, in the past, when I've been with you, I've often brought a joke or a story to share. I don't have that today, but what I do want to uh, say before we pray is just a word of thanks, especially now in these extraordinary times to each of you and for all that you are doing to support our communities, our economy, and the well-being of so many people here and really around the world. Would you pray with me? Oh God of springtime and harvest, we give you thanks for being the Lord of all the seasons of our lives. From birth to death, you hold us in your hands and you feed us with the abundance of the earth and with your Holy Spirit. Especially today, we give you thanks for those who work in the earth, those that you have created, farmers and gardeners who till the soil and plant the seed, tend the crops and harvest so others may eat. Remind us each day that every good and perfect gift comes from you and that we are not truly owners, but only stewards of the land and the crops that you give us. We also remember today those who work in the factories and the industries that produce what we need to live and thrive. We are so grateful for their hard work and their creative minds and their deep commitment to serve others through technologies and new ways of producing. With our eyes and hearts focused on those who raise crops and work in industries, we cannot help but also remember those without bountiful resources or steady food sources, as well as those who have lost crops this week or those whose means of support has dried up in these extraordinary days. Embrace with your wide heart and your tender hands, O oh God, all who are struggling and all who are making sacrifices in these extraordinary times so that others may be fed and live. Bind us together in one heart, one purpose, and in support of each other. Give us the courage as individuals to seek help when we need it, knowing that true strength and healing often comes through honesty and reliance on others. Finally, O oh God, in thanksgiving for this day and for all your good gifts, we lift up this time and this community of ag leaders and workers and farmers to your care. Help us all to plant seeds of hope, to be harvesters of justice and growers of grace. In your holy name we pray, amen. Is that thing on? <laughs> hey y'all, welcome to quarantine. <laughs> hey Brent. Hey Jay. Did you hear about that farmer that got an award last week? No, I didn't. What did he get an award for, Jay? He got an award for being outstanding in his field. <laughs> <laughs> but in all serious, Jay, we've got to be a little bit serious right now. Yes, we do. We want to thank you all for coming out to the annual Ag Breakfast. I'm Jay Brooks. I'm Britt. We're from the Morning Rush on 98.7 Kiss Country. You can tune in. We have a lot of fun. We enjoy the farmers that call in. We enjoy the farmers that and listen to us up and down the corn rows, even though they're using GPS and don't even steer their tractor anymore. <laughs> but hey, that's okay. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, everything you guys do, much appreciated. Uh, so we can't say that enough for everything that you guys do. And of course, being growing up on the farm, both Jay and I, we know that it is hard out there. And especially during this year, which is a lot different than most years, it's great that so many of you could get together here for the egg breakfast. Absolutely. So again, enjoy yourself. The, the, guest speaker is on the way and again thank you if you don't listen to 987 kiss country you better start and you can join us for more quarantine hello and welcome to ag breakfast 2020 I'm Matt Bradley. I have a lot of great memories of this event. In fact, I emceed it back in 2016. This year, I'm here to tell you about First Security Bank and how we have 13 locations throughout North Iowa. So no matter where you are, you are near us. Check us out at firstsecuritybank.com. Now, while I'm happy to be here and tell you about First Security's ag expertise, I think that story is actually better told by Scott McGregor, a beef producer from rural Nashua. So I will leave you with that 
as well as our wishes that you have a wonderful year. McGregor Farms, we're around the Nashua, Charles City, Chickasaw, Floyd County area. It's just a very typical Iowa family farm. We feed cattle, we raise corn and soybeans, alfalfa. We're pretty solid with for security. I'm third generation at the bank, so that tells you right there that we've been with them a long time. That's important that you have a lender that gets what you do every day, having good partners there to help us through, making decisions to make the farm profitable. I would recommend them to anybody. First Security Bank and Trust, your ag partner for generations to come. The premise here is not that we're just going to try to get back to where we were. It's that we're going to try to spring forward. It's that we're going to try to take the next steps. That we're going to think about where do we want to be as a state? What have we learned? What are, what are some of the gaps or weaknesses or, or maybe some of the strengths that we saw? And can we build on those things? Um, you know, those, those, are, those are good things to be talking about. And, and where do we want to go? What's next for agriculture? What are the challenges? Uh, but I'll tell you that... I'm, I'm glad that, and I, my colleagues in other states are doing the same types of things, but I, I'll tell you, and I, I've had one of them tell me, uh, you guys are still Iowa after all. You're, you're still coming at this from a position of strength. And, and I, uh, I sometimes need to be reminded of that, um, but we are still Iowa and we are still a strong agriculture state. And there's reasons for that. And there's a strong foundation, which means we have tremendous opportunity. And as a state, we're healthy. Uh, we're not talking about needing a bailout as a state. We're, we're financially sound, even in a challenging time. We had a rainy day fund and it's raining. Um, but those things don't happen by accident. And so it is, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing to be coming at recovery and on this side of things from a position of strength rather than just trying to hang on, and trying to survive. And uh, those are things I think we can be, we can be very thankful for and we'll be, uh, we'll be wise and won't be uh, needing to be thoughtful about how to use that strength. But uh, we have opportunities as a state to grow and be better uh, because of this. So, uh, so with that, I, I'll close. I'd be happy to answer any questions about, uh, again, what's happened this week, uh, COVID, anything that you'd like to uh, visit about. Um, I could talk for another hour and, and not recap anything, and, and uh, we'd still be talking about new things, but I think that's way too much. So uh, I'll just uh, turn it back to y'all and be happy to take any questions. All right, so if anybody wants to put something in the chat box, uh, I can read it off of that, or if you'd just like to chime in, uh, just go ahead and unmute your mic and you can probably go ahead and ask the question too. And while we wait for maybe some of those first questions to come in, uh, Mr. Secretary, are you finding that not doing things status quo, like not doing things because of the pandemic or whatever, I mean, now all of a sudden you're finding new ways to do things? So, so do you see maybe some, some silver linings in some of the things that you are doing and hey, maybe there's a new way of doing things they never thought of before. I, I do, I do. And I, I'm, I believe me, I'm, I think we're all desperate to find those things that we would say, well, you know, here's some good news today. And, and uh, I, I, I do believe, and I, I look at this a few different ways. You know, one, I, you know, I'm, I'm an employer myself. I'm, I, I run an, an office here. We run an agency that does uh, things that, are, that we hope are meaningful and, and that we're providing good customer service. And I will tell you that just from our operational standpoint um, and how we've managed our workforce and how our workforce has responded and, and what we've had to do from an IT standpoint to allow remote um, access and I believe one will be a better, I, I, I know, will be a better employer uh, because of some of the things that we've experienced in the last couple of months. I believe that uh, that will have a, an impact on talent recruitment for us, which is a challenge. And we, we see a challenge as our workforce here at the department um, uh, gets up there in age. Uh, you know, we need to be recruiting. And I think some additional flexibility in the workplace will be key to that. And uh, we're thinking about those things differently already than we had been. And then from a customer service standpoint, uh, this has probably been the biggest mover for us is uh, we must do a better job um, to uh, you know, move out of the paper world, to be able to go digital. Um, you know, one example is, and some of you probably dealt with this this year, is you know, uh, in the past, to get a pesticide applicator license from the state of Iowa, you know, it was a very paper intensive process, write a check and send it to us. We couldn't even take an electronic payment. Well, uh, that has all changed. It, right in the middle of a pandemic, we launched a new uh, customer service portal that is all online. And uh, those are the types of things that we need to do more of. So I would say that just from an ops standpoint, 
uh, we will be better uh, because of, of what we've experienced in the last six months. Go outside of the walls of the department. I, I, I believe that um, we will look at this entire food and agriculture supply chain and uh, we will have to identify and, and already are, shame on us if we don't learn a few things, right? There's some things that work well, there's some things that we can do better and uh, we need to understand that. And so, uh, and, and what can we do about that? And, and so I think there's some things there. Uh, we've been talking a lot about foreign animal diseases in the last uh, couple of years, African swine fever in particular. You know, we learned a lot about the movement of animals and how things can be managed uh, in our pork supply chain because of what we had to go through. And there's been significant learnings there as well uh, that we will be able to and already are applying to the, to the foreign animal disease prevention and preparedness. So um, lots of lessons here. And, and then you shift gears to what we've just, what we're going through in the crop side uh, there too. We will learn a lot. There's a very, very widespread opportunity to generate a lot of data uh, about what, what we've just experienced and what some of the, the, you know, the learnings can be from that. So uh, yes, we must. In fact, that's something we in agriculture, we know how to do this, right? You adapt, you learn, you pivot, you uh, apply, you, you, uh, you look for new ways. And so that's sort of how we're wired. And uh, there's been lots of learning opportunities this year. Excellent. Great question. Yep, got a question here from the uh, Globe Gazette. How much greater has the problem of food waste been over the past few months because of the pandemic versus before? Food waste. You know, um, I don't know that I can that I can address that. Uh, you know, you typically would think of food waste coming from um, unused food that that you know doesn't get purchased at the grocery store. Of course, we've seen increased demand there. So that's, I don't know. I don't, I'd only be speculating about whether there's been increase or decrease food waste coming out of grocery stores. Certainly from a restaurant standpoint and a food service standpoint, just because of the, the dramatic reduction in, uh, in uh, usage there, you know, again, I, I, I suspect, I would speculate that uh, food waste and, and what's left over there is dramatically reduced. Um, for, for us, for a state like Iowa, um, if you go outside of the state and you look at states where you've got a lot of fruit and veg production, um, I think you, you definitely were hearing about and know about some, some things. Again, uh, products that had to be timely harvested. So if you're growing, you know, uh, if you're growing lettuce that goes specifically into food service, you've got a narrow window for delivering that. And so I, I do know and I believe that there was um, you know, food that uh, was wasted or crops that were not able to be harvested because the demand just was not there um, on farm. The closest example that we have in Iowa would be that in that liquid egg market, uh, we know that some of those producers had to just dispose of the, the egg product because uh, the egg, chickens lay eggs every single day. And, uh, and we know that you know, there was no market, there was nowhere to move that product. And so there was some of that. And of course we did hear early on, although it was very short lived, there was some milk that did have to be dumped because again, there was a disruption in that. So, so, so if, you, if you're referring to food waste from that standpoint, there was some, uh, but I think you'd have to look really outside of the state of Iowa uh, you know, to, to, to see a lot more widespread examples of, of food being wasted on farm. Okay. Another question, uh, expand on our opportunities with China and what do you see happening with them moving forward? You know, uh, if you can tell me what's going to happen with China, I'd like to visit with, no, I, I shouldn't make light. Uh, you know, as you think about coming into 2020, I have to say that I, I expected to and, and, and wanted to be talking a lot about, I thought this would probably be a year that we talk a lot about trade. I was expecting to spend a lot of time on an airplane. Um, I was expecting that we were going to be talking a lot about uh, you know, some new deals, um, what's happening with uh, taking full advantage of a USMCA that gets passed you know, at the end of the calendar year. You've got a PAN phase one, a food and agriculture agreement that's in place. You've got a China phase one agreement. And, uh, and we know that we've got a US trade rep and a USDA trade office that's playing offense on trade. You know, I thought, I would have guessed, this would have been a year that we would have talked a heck of a lot about trade. And, uh, and it's so important to us as a state. Again, I stated it before, we're second in the nation when it comes to the value of our food and agriculture products that we export. So trade matters to us. 
and uh, we feel the pain and we experience the benefit when uh, when that's going well or, or not well. Um, with China, it's complicated. How do I, <laughs> that's an understatement, right? We do have a phase one agreement. Um, now, is it lock solid? Is, are there um, enforceable provisions of it when it comes to them buying a certain amount of food and egg product? No, uh, you know, there's, there's a, a, a goal. And then there's lots of provisions that allow them to not purchase. Um, but I still think that a phase one agreement is, we're better off having it because this isn't just about them buying more of our stuff. That's important and we need them to, and they, they should be, uh, and they should be wanting to buy our products because they're the best in the world and we're oftentimes very, very competitive. There are times that we're not, but there are most of the time we're very competitive from a price standpoint and certainly from a quality standpoint. But there were a whole host of other things that were in that phase one agreement. You know, how many times had we heard about uh, non-tariff barriers that had been put up, um, you know, that had been put up uh, to keep out, you know, keep out uh, ethanol, keep out DDGs, keep out beef, keep, uh, keep out poultry, uh, well-documented intellectual property thefts, um, forcing U.S. companies into joint ventures with Chinese companies in order to do business in the, in, in the country. How many times had we heard about a shipment of corn getting to port in China and then, oops, they found a trait that was not approved. Turn that cargo around and then what's happened? what happens to the price of corn in the United States? Drops. What's China do next? Buys. Now, these are things that have been happening for years. So it can't be just about them buying stuff. It's got to be about um, addressing some of those non-tariff barriers about true access to that market for the products that, that we produce very, very well. Again, protein, um, they got a lot of people. You can't forget that. They've got a lot of people. They got a middle class that exceeds the entire US population, uh, folks that want protein. They've got environmental and air quality issues. They need renewable fuels. Um, they're putting up barriers again to keep some of those products out. So whether we sell them corn and soybeans or we sell them protein, um, or we sell them corn to make ethanol, or we sell them ethanol, there's lots of opportunities. But of course, our relationship is just one that's, uh, they're never going to be our friend, and, and uh, we're certainly going through a, a, another bumpy period right now. So I'm still hopeful that we will see significant purchases of, of products that matter to us, um, you know, in the, in, the, in the next few months. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's about all I can say on that. And we need to stay focused on this relationship. We can't be giving things away. We can't roll over. We've got to be a, a tough trading negotiator and a tough uh, partner that insists on them living up to their end of the bargain. Um, but we, we do need this market. And I think I would argue they need us. Yeah. A couple of final questions here. Um, and I don't know how long you want to get in on this one because you've talked about it already, but somebody joined us a little bit late and they just wanted to know if you could talk a little bit again about the impact of the storms and the, yeah. uh, the cost of it and stuff. Yeah, you know, I, uh, again, I, it, it, it's too, too soon to tell on the cost other than to say that, again, we've got millions of acres of, of, of crop land that's been impacted uh, and, and uh, it'll take us some time to fully assess the, the extent of that damage. You're going to have a lot of corn that will still get combined. It'll certainly have a yield reduction. Um, one of the great challenges will be you, you'll still have yield in the field. Uh, you may not be able to get it in the combine because it's laying down. That'll create some real challenges. Um, once you do get it in the combine, uh, you, you will have to be very mindful of some quality issues because you've got that corn laying down. It doesn't have airflow around it. You may have some light uh, test weights. You may have some uh, disease issues. Uh, on the plant. And so those are some of the challenges. And then of course, storage. Uh, we've lost a significant amount of storage, millions and millions of bushels worth of commercial and on-farm uh, grain storage. And, and uh, those dollar up very, very quickly as well. Um, we did see, I didn't mention this earlier, but we did see some damage to livestock buildings, no loss of livestock uh, that we're aware of, but we did see some monoslope buildings and some, some uh, you know, roofs on uh, on livestock buildings that, that came down or were, were damaged. And so uh, there's a lot of, lot of repair work that needs to be done here over the next, uh, you know, the coming weeks. Next question, this one might take, you know, 10 days to answer, but uh, please explain government programs for farmers and do they help with cash flow for agriculture? Yeah, uh, good, good question. You know, um, you're coming off of a couple of years of market facilitation payments related to trade disruption as we came into COVID, uh, the CFAP program, 
um, was uh, was implemented by Congress and and USDA is putting the dollars out and um, so we've seen a, a, a first round of that and uh, uh, you know corn soybean livestock we just got we just got liquid egg included in that um, there's the food purchase programs that have an impact you know I think the as we look at what Congress is talking about now um, you know we we uh, we still believe that there's a market disruption and as long as that's what we're using to justify uh, some assistance to farmers, then I think we can still make the argument that there's a supply chain, there's a, there's a food and agriculture supply chain disruption that still requires some support. And so I would argue that we need to continue to pay attention to that. And you know, when, when markets return, then, uh, then, then uh, you know, payments uh, can, can cease. But uh, as long as that market disruption is still tied to the response to COVID-19, then I think we should absolutely be looking uh, at that. So um, those are those are the types of payments or you know programs that we're looking at. Um, cash flow is an absolute is a significant concern, and and so I, I think uh, we've got to continue to be creative ab about how to how to supply that. But um, you know this is going to be a longer road here than I think what any of us want it to be uh, before we can truly say that things are are, are back to normal. Final question, and I guess this is kind of a personal one. Have you do you stay in contact with Bill Northey, your old boss, much? I mean, and, and how much of a how much of an advantage is that for you as the Iowa Ag Secretary to have somebody in his position at the national level? Well, for, yeah, so Bill's a great friend, um, just a personal friend, a mentor of mine, and and in fact, I, I was able to see him uh, two weeks ago. He was back in Iowa. We did the uh, the tractor ride uh, together uh, over in. Uh, we were in Monticello at the Great Jones County Fair, and had a chance to have uh, supper with him and and spend a little time and and uh, visit with him. And you know, uh, we do get a chance to talk pretty regularly, and uh, both just both on a personal level and of course uh, professionally and officially as well. Uh, does it help to have a Bill Northy in that chair? Absolutely. You know, uh, when you think about the ability to pick up the phone and call somebody and not have to start at square one to just be able to say hey here's what's happening what's you know let's talk about this oh my gosh it's tremendously helpful to be able to get on to talking about solutions and and uh, bill understands bill understands iowa agriculture very well and and uh, i think he's doing a tremendous job in that role it's a very difficult job and uh, and we have to remember he has an, in a role where he has to think about all of u.s agriculture now he's doing a good job of that but i would i would say we've got you know this this USDA team um, is is one that we've had tremendous access to folks that I've known for years, and uh, again they're they're people that I uh, would count as folks that know what's going on on the ground, and uh, that's important when you're in roles like like they are. So uh, yes, uh, good it's it's a it's good to have a friend like him where he is. All right, I don't know how much time you have, but I do have a couple more questions. I, I probably better take maybe one more and then I okay yes. well, I think this is a great way to end here. Um, do you have advice for young farmers who may be nervous to enter the field at this time? Uh, um, I wish I could just remove all the uncertainty that's out there you know um, but that's just that's just not possible and I, I would say um, I've heard this said many many times which is it's never been easy to get into into farming. And uh, that remains true today. Lots of challenges, especially for young people. It's hard enough to have young people getting into an operation or you know, the next generation that have a family tie and they can work into an operation. Um, incredibly difficult for somebody to start uh, completely unattached from, from folks. And, uh, and so you know, I know that's a challenging thing and yet my goodness, we need that beginning farmer and they don't have to be a young farmer by the way I, I've gotten over saying that I met a I met a rather old beginning farmer uh, just just the other day and that's okay that's a good thing um, and uh, beginning farmers and, and but they're the folks I'm, I'm frankly most worried about right now as we think about tight margins tough times um, you know the equity is not necessarily there to deal with the stress of what we're going through the the hit of a of an event and uh, they, they're on my mind. And, and yet, so I think about, this is where I think, you know, well, but, but why, why can we continue to be optimistic about what we do here? You know, you still have to dial back, zoom out and think about 
I go back to the comment, we're still Iowa. We still do some things really, really well. Uh, we do some things that matter to the world. Um, we do some things that matter domestically. And we're in a great position to continue to do those things. And yet, again, knowing that change is constant, we've got opportunities to diversify. We've got opportunities to add value to our products right here at home for their processing. We're well on our way to doing things in a way that, uh, you know, we're going to have to talk, we're going to have to get really, really comfortable talking about carbon and carbon sequestration in agriculture in the next uh, few years. We've got a tremendous opportunity not to just export the value of carbon sequestration and the conservation practices that we do in the state of Iowa, but try to retain some of that value right here. And how do we be, how do we, how do we really innovative about those things? Uh, how can we leverage that? It's the right thing to do from a soil health standpoint, from our operational standpoint, but the, these carbon, these credits, these nutrient credits may have value to others. And how can we retain some of that in the state of Iowa? So what I would say is uh, the global demographics still tell me that what we do here is very relevant, very, very important, and that there will be opportunities to be profitable and be, and be successful. And that once again, we come at this from a position of strength and that we have an opportunity to further diversify, further add value. Um, there's, there's many, many things that we, we can do. Um, and the other piece is uh, we must as a state, and we, we need to show even more of a commitment to this, that opportunity needs to, opportunities need to exist. Economic opportunities need to exist all across the state because oftentimes we know with beginning farmers and young farmers um, that, that it's a spouse working off the farm or it's a part-time job off the farm or it's healthcare or it's childcare or it's education, you know, those are all things that are really important in, in terms of making uh, a beginning farmer's experience work as well as it's not just what's happening on the farm, but what's happening around the farm and what's that support system look like and making sure that economic opportunity exists there too. So those are the types of things we need to be thinking about, um, but I still think there's tremendous opportunity. Outstanding. Well, I appreciate all your time here today. I know we have one other question about uh, whether or not what you're going to talk about with the vice president today, but oh. you kind of talked about that. Uh, well, bit. let me, I will have, be happy to tell you, I'd be happy to. Uh, 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 one, we're going to talk storm damage because, you know, they're, they're, I, 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 people must know uh, how widespread uh, th this is. And that's the thing that, sh that just has been hard to get my head around is it's widespread. This is different than a typical uh, storm that would roll through Iowa, too. Uh, we have got to see certainty with renewable fuels and uh, uh, some of the actions that EPA is considering right now uh, must, must be dealt with. And uh, I would urge immediately. And, uh, and then the trade picture. We've got to talk about trade um, and uh, China being one of those pieces. But uh, those will be three of the things. And if I can get more in there, believe me, I will. But uh, those will be three things that I'll, I'll be uh, trying, to, trying to get my, uh, my, my say in on. Sounds excellent. We appreciate your time here this morning. Thank you very much. And too bad we weren't doing this face to face, but I think this worked very well. So we appreciate it. We'll look forward to the next time. All right. Thanks, everybody. That is Iowa Secretary of Agriculture, Mike Nag. So thank you very much uh, uh, for that. So again, thanks to Koloff Media, one of our great sponsors, Holiday Inn Express, uh, First Security Bank um, as well. And then of course, Dream Dirt too, as our great sponsors here for the Mason City uh, Chamber of Commerce. And of course, thanks to the Agriculture, uh, the Ag Business Committee of the Mason City Chamber of Commerce. So that's kind of wrapping things up here today. Again, uh, I think excellent discussion with uh, Iowa Ag Secretary Mike Nag. We certainly appreciate his time. To get, he gave us more than enough time uh, today. I thought that was excellent. And again, he's going to be meeting with the Vice President uh, a little bit later on this afternoon, and that's why he wasn't here in person. But we certainly appreciate his time here this morning. So thank you very much again. We hope to do this in the traditional way uh, next year, coming up in what, March? I believe it normally is. So hopefully we'll see everybody and have uh, you know Brian Carlson's eggs and omelets and all that kind of fun stuff as well. So thank you very much for joining us today.